Well, good morning, church. Pastor Kyle here. Welcome back to the Daily Word. We're going to continue our study in Acts 15. And what we find here is a very interesting moment in early church history. So as you remember, the book of Acts is the very beginning of church history as church began at Pentecost, which we saw in chapter 2. So the very same church that we're part of, all of history that's gone on for the last 2,000 years, the church, the foundation, the, 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 the institution that Christ built started here. And in this moment, this is uh, what is known as the Council of Jerusalem. So this is really uh, the very first time that all of the church leaders from all of the different areas came together. And now there weren't that many, it was Jerusalem and there were a few other areas, but the leadership all came together to discuss a major issue. Uh, we see things like that today with some of our uh, larger leaders, uh, you know, things like the uh, Chicago uh, uh, Summit on Inerrancy and the recent statement on social justice and things like that where church leaders come together to discuss important topics to the church and to the culture and find out what the Word of God has to say to gain wisdom from each other. So this is what's happening here. So it says, some of the men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. This is the very first instance of what we uh, call the party of the circumcision or the Judaizers, the ones who claim that in order to become a Christian, if you're a Gentile, you had to become a Jew first. And this is clearly against scripture. And so what's happening here is it says, when Paul and Barnabas uh, had great dissension and debate with them. Now they came down from Judea. So this is the, this is the, uh, the, the right around the area of Jerusalem. We find out later, a lot of these guys are guys who got saved out of the party of the Pharisees. So it says that Paul and Barnabas set to go up to Jerusalem and they, they cross through the regions of Phoenicia and Samaria and they're encouraging the saints and the brethren on everything that's gone on on their missionary journey, which is really cool. Uh, all the signs and wonders and all the conversions and the establishment of churches all over the place. So it says when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders and they reported all that God had done with them. So they're telling them the same thing and the church up there received them. So we're, we're, we see right away that the other apostles note that Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's been given the gift of apostleship. He's been uh, taught the ministry by Jesus himself and uh, he's an equal. So he's welcomed in uh, and as well as Barnabas. It says the apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. So this is the matter of this, do people need to become Jews before they become Christians? And as they talk, after much debate, Peter stood up and said, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. So we see a constant thread. God never changes. From Abraham to right now, this moment in church history, salvation is by faith alone. All right, and that's important. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of, a dis of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Yet another confession here that salvation never came by the law of Moses. In fact, Paul would say later in Galatians that the law was a tutor meant to show that our unworthiness, their inability uh, to be righteous and their need for a savior. So and it says when they, it says, you know, in verse 11, but we believe uh, that we are saved through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in the same way as they are also. And all the people kept silent and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them. So they're having a good old time. Peter stands up and gives a great defense of salvation by, by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. And then James gets up and says, after they'd stopped speaking, James answered and said, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon or, or Peter has uh, related how God first concerned himself about t taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. So God was going to do this. Uh, he told Peter he was going to do this. And with these words, the prophets agree. So he quotes from Jeremiah and from Amos here. After these things, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins. And I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. 
So this is a beautiful truth that they're, the disciples here are realizing that God is is bringing in those Gentiles. He's rebuilding his tabernacle, the, the church, the, the light to the world that Israel was meant to be, that now the church is, at least for a time. And the Gentiles are going to be part of that. So he says, therefore, it is not or it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they may abstain from from certain things. So they're acknowledging we don't want legalism here. We don't want to put a burden on them of the law, which, hey, Peter just told us even we couldn't accomplish. Right. What we want to do, though, is encourage them in some some wisdom. And so this is what happens here in, in this letter that they pen. So if you notice in verse uh, 23 on to verse 29, this is a letter. So it'd be as if the church counseled all of the leaders of the, of the early church got together and wrote a letter to every kind of fledgling, uh, you know, new church among the Gentiles to say, listen, here's some godly wisdom for you. We're not going to expect that you're circumcised or follow the law of Moses. We acknowledge that that is not part of salvation. But what we're going to ask of you is that you basically what James sums up in uh, in in his book later on, pure and undefiled religion, right, is keeping oneself uh, unstained from the world. And so he's giving them a little of an example of how to do that. Don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Um, you know, uh, uh, what else does he say here? Uh, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols, abstain from fornication, these kind of things. It's like now that you're a Christian, these are things that Christians don't do. All right? We don't celebrate festivals to demons disguised as idols. We don't do these things. And so he's just giving them basic level wisdom here of how to keep oneself unstained by the world. Uh, so this is kind of initial basic instruction. Now, wisdom and discernment would come in later. Of course, fornication, sex outside of marriage, outside of a single union of a man and a woman uh, created that way at birth is always wrong. But he's just giving some basic level instruction here and some expectations that believers, once you become a Christian, there is a call on your life. There is a way to live uh, and uh, keeping oneself unstained by the world, setting oneself apart, becoming holy, sanctified is part of that process. So it says, when they were sent away, that's Paul and Barnabas, they went down to Antioch and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. And after they had spent some time there, they were sent away by the brethren in peace to those who had sent them out. So Judas and Silas go out. This is a different Judas than the one that we know from the gospels. Um, uh, but it seemed good to Silas to remain there at Antioch. But Paul and Barnabas stayed at Antioch, teaching and preaching. And then this last little bit, it says, After some days, Paul and Barnabas said, Let us return to the brethren in every city. Now they have a disagreement here. Barnabas says, We need to take John Mark. And Paul says, No, he abandoned us halfway through the trip early on. I'm not taking that guy. And so they get into it a little bit. And this is an interesting moment in church history as well, because the first missionary team splits up. Now it doesn't mean one was right and the other was wrong. It just meant that... Uh, even in disagreement, these brethren loved each other. They had a, a disagreement of ministry philosophy. And so they decide, you know what, let's, let's you go there. I'll go here. We can accomplish the work together. You take John Mark. I will take Silas. Uh, and so you see the, the spirit at work and uh, working in both parties, uh, accomplishing the goal that he is going to have them accomplish. So even what you know, we, we know from scripture, what, what man meant for evil, God meant for good. Uh, not that they meant evil on each other, but sin is just missing the mark. And right, we, we want to have perfect fellowship and communion with God and with the saints. And sometimes that doesn't happen. But uh, God decided to accomplish his goal anyway. And Silas and Paul go out on what is known as the second missionary journey. They circle back through the churches where they had already planted in Asia Minor. And they expand that trip through a few other areas as well. And they, it says here, they traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And again, that's the whole point. Missionary journeys are meant to go out and establish and strengthen churches. So we see that from the very beginning. That's the kind of missionary work we want to do and support. Uh, we can expand that mission uh, to include discipleship training, things like that. But we want to be focused on the local church 
establishing, planting, growing, strengthening local churches. And that's what we see from the beginning. So that's chapter 15. I hope you've enjoyed our time together. Join us on uh, tomorrow, Saturday morning, July 4th, Independence Day for chapter 16. I'll see you then.